Welcome to our panel, How Social Media Has Changed the News Cycle. I'm very happy to be joined today by Holly Edgel from WCPO, uh, uh, Jack Greiner from uh, Gradenhead, media attorney, uh, Jackie Rowe from Game Day Communications, and Jason Williams from the Cincinnati uh, Inquirer. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves uh, in just a moment, uh, say a few words about what they do and how social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, you name it, has impacted their jobs as, as journalists. How has it impacted their day-to-day -day routine? Now for Jack, that question is going to be a little bit different as a media attorney. Uh, I'm going to ask him to summarize maybe some of the most frequent issues or questions that he gets uh, from journalists on, uh-oh, oh, I did good. this and how much trouble uh, am good. I in uh, with social media. <laughs> uh, since the title of our panel is How Social Media Has Changed the News Cycle, not has it changed the news cycle, I'm going to assume that we all agree uh, that it has had some effect, that it has, uh, in fact, uh, changed the news cycle. So I would like to accomplish three different things with our panel today. Uh, one uh, is simply to describe the ways in which social media has changed the news cycle and the process of journalistic storytelling. And in doing so, too, I'd like to tease out some of the ways in which social media has enhanced or improved journalism as well as uh, some of the ways in which it has problematized it. But too often uh, it seems that we, we tend to focus on the negative, uh, and certainly from my own observations, I think there, are, there is a lot of good uh, as well, and so I want to uh, bring that to the fore. And then third, um, since, especially since we have some journalism students here, uh, I'd like to tease out some tips, some best practices for journalists uh, to use social media more effectively and certainly how they can uh, avoid some of the pitfalls having to call uh, uh, Jack. Not that I want to take away any of your, any, any way your business, which business I'm sure is, is, is booming the, uh, <laughs> these days. So uh, after a grand tour of, uh, of these areas, maybe about 30, 40 minutes in, uh, we'd like to open up the floor uh, to questions and conversation uh, as well. So uh, let's uh, get right into it then. I'll start with uh, Holly. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and the, the role that social media has played in uh, your day-to-day -day routine. Sure, so uh, my title at WCPO is community editor, which did not exist um, before 2012. Some of you may have seen that we are ramping up our digital efforts at WCPO and creating original content and really um, making uh, a mark with social media because we feel it's a really important piece of the journalism puzzle. So um, I, my background is as a television news producer, but I've also written for print. I've been a freelancer. I've been a teacher. Um, but for me, um, this is the best of times for my career. I love the way social media has allowed us to um, create a two-way street. I almost feel a little bit like, where was this? Where is this all my life? I, I feel, <laughs> I feel so um, inspired and excited by the connection. Um, it's not always pretty. It's not always nice, but it's real and genuine. And so for me, um, uh, I oversee strategy for WCPO until about 5 p.m. today, and then I'm being transferred <laughs> to um, our sister station in Kansas City, where I'll be in charge of the digital team there, um, of which social media will be a huge part of my job there as well. Um, but so to me, the basics of journalism haven't changed. We must still verify, we must still strive to be fair and accurate. But I think social media provides uh, venues uh, unthought of when I was in J school. And um, did I answer your questions? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Very, very okay, good. that's this. <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought, but thank you. For, for starters, anyway. <laughs> Jack. Uh, so I, uh, I'm an attorney at Graydon Head. I've been uh, an attorney since 1983, so longer than I, I care to imagine sometimes. I've been doing media work for about 20 years. I started really with, uh, in print, uh, uh, representing the Cincinnati Enquirer and started doing that in 1995. I've also done television and, and radio uh, and in a variety of other formats. And I suppose that the uh, social media has affected my practice in, in several ways. It, it has increased the speed because there is pressure to get things online and stories that, that probably, uh, again, you know, from the print uh, perspective, a story that, that would have probably been looked at and edited and, and, and thought about 
until the next you know, until later that evening when it when it got put up on the the press and, and run now the pressure on the reporters is to get it online you know much quicker almost real time in some respects so uh, i've got to be able to respond quickly uh, and competently in less time than i probably used to uh, i also get different questions uh, that probably i would not have gotten i, I did not get you know, in 1995, because that that probably was be, certainly before a lot of the use of the internet um, or the heavy use. And yeah, that's just a lot of those questions are: Can I use this? I found this on YouTube, or I found this on Facebook, or you know, we we've got a, a school shooting, and I found this kid's picture on Facebook who's been accused. Can I use that? So those kind of questions really probably didn't exist about 20 years ago. And then I think just the format issue, some of the rules that apply in different settings, like um, the, the what are called the rules of superintendents that govern the coverage of court proceedings, uh, they, they address broadcast and, and recording court events, and they, they set rules about what you can do and how you can do it. Well, you know, again, is, is a live blog from a court proceeding, is that broadcasting? Is it recording? What is that exactly? So you, you sort of have technology that's maybe outstripped the the existing rules and so we've had to work through some of those issues with with some courts and then I guess finally <clears throat> excuse me um, it I think I think social media and the internet have expanded um, <clears throat> the notion of you know who's a publisher and who's a content producer and provider and so I've had I've uh, been able to counsel uh, you know clients like banks and schools on what would at one time have been a media question and now these non-traditional media entities are looking for advice about content and and that sort of thing so it's expanded i think the pool of of who constitutes a publisher and who constitutes a content provider Good morning. Uh, my name is Jackie Rowe, and um, first of all, I'd just like to to commend Jeremy and Alana for this effort. It's it's just amazing. And from my cursory research, I think this is really the only university in America doing such a robust schedule of programming for social media, and it's really important. I'm an adjunct professor here as well in sports PR, and you know. Six, seven years ago, we wouldn't even breathe the term social media. It's not in our textbook. So we spend a lot of time talking about social media in my classroom. And, and certainly, um, I spend a lot of time um, in my profession. But I always say I'm an old school PR girl gone digital for survival. And I, like Holly, um, praise the Lord every day for social media <laughs> in a number of ways. And I'll talk about that later. But. Um, you know, I spent five years in healthcare in Cincinnati, and it was a job, you know, thank you every other Friday paycheck. And then I spent five years at the Cincinnati Art Museum as director of marketing and PR. And then when I turned 30, I kind of had this aha moment that I wanted to combine my passions and my profession. So I love sports, sports marketing, I love PR. So I've been with Game Day Communications now 13 years. and. Um, social media for me um, has been a true game changer, if, to use that term, um, in many ways. And for me, it's it's kind of um, every time I pitch. So I'm pitching the likes of Jason and, and Holly, and you know I'm fighting the other hundreds of communicators in this city for you know some column inches in the Enquirer, um, you know 45 seconds on WCPO at six o'clock. You know, so if I don't have a weather story the last couple of weeks, I'm probably out of luck, <laughs> right? So I'm, food. yeah, dog that's right, food. or dog food, yeah, right. So I'm always thinking about that four screen, that um, four screen consumer, and I'm always thinking about how to use social media, video, visuals to tell my story. So social media has been an amazing tool for me to do that. You know, the days of me just putting Jack the lawyer on um, the 7 a.m. news morning show are over, right? They want, you know, a bourbon tasting, you know, make a monster, have an artist. So you've, you've really got to tell your story in a really dynamic and visual way. And I think social media allows you to do that. I'm happy to do a bourbon tasting. <laughs> Uh, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Jeremy and Jeff. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm a UC grad, and, and long before there was a journalism program, so I'm really very proud of that. And uh, 
really longed for that for this university, so um, it's great. Uh, I'm a transportation reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer. I know that sounds pretty wonky, but it's, very, it's a very sexy beat. Um, uh, especially right now, with unfortunately with bridges falling and uh, streetcar and um, Brent Spence Bridge and big wave of people who want transit and rail, so red bike and um, ch you know I was talking to Nick Veer last week about uh, he's a he owns his own communications firm here in town, a former city councilman, and he I was asking him about how um, the bridge that fell and the CEO of the company that was building the bridge on Hopple Street um, just came out before any litigation and just said, look, we made, we made a mistake. And so I asked him, like, what, what that's very, uh, it's very rare for that to happen uh, for, you know, you know, they want to lawyer up and no comment, everything. And he said, it's because of social media and nothing, everything comes out. The truth now comes out, whereas before it maybe only came out in court, it now comes out instantly on social media. And so it really hit me like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, but that was the first time it really hit home with me that like, yeah, there's nothing is a secret anymore. And so it's our job as reporters and journalists and editors to decipher what is true that's being thrown on social media and what's, you know, not. Um, my big experience with it is I'm, I'm competitive to the core, so I, I um, love the, the rush of it and that uh, there's nothing that, nothing is really exclusive anymore. So in that way, it's a little frustrating, but in the other way, it's like you can get it out faster. And it's really key, the big thing I'm really big on is getting it, even if I can get it like three minutes before the competition because, and the key thing is because I can get the jump on social media and away it goes and when we're competing for every digital dollar in this world it's i really feel like it's critical so all right why don't we uh start off with uh, maybe an easy question uh about hoaxes in social media and certainly hoaxes are, are not anything that is the, that is new but certainly they seem to be uh more prevalent where rumors can spread like wildfire on social media and kind of pick up on the last point there uh by jason how do journalists balance the need for speed with the ethical norm of accuracy uh in in, in monitoring uh, social media and the information uh that is that is oftentimes put out there and I'll, I'll throw that out for anyone who wants to uh, take that one. Well, I, I would say that um, just because uh, you can do it, should you. That's my mantra. Um, I think that we have um, pressure to tweet first, uh, retweet first, and what have you. But we have to remember the basics of journalism. You would never report a story on the air or in print or on your or on, um, online if, it, if you couldn't verify the information. So you still have to verify and confirm. And I think that be, even though social media is very fast, we also have much faster means of finding the truth or finding the source of the information uh, and verifying. So we need to be able to, to put on our investigative caps. I always think of every journalist as an investigative journalist um, in a way. So the minute you see a, a tweet from someone that may that looks like it could be a cool story but could equally be you know absolutely false um, or someone did a really great job with Photoshop you still need to do your due diligence as a um, you know as a journalist and I think you look at the source you know if, if, if it's from Devin Stills verified Twitter account that his daughter is sitting in a hospital bed in a princess dress because she does not want to wear scrubs anymore, which this happened this week. <laughs> we feel pretty confident in retweeting that because Twitter, Twitter goes through a verification process um, for high profile persons, uh, as well as many journalists. Um, and we feel okay with that. Now, if someone posted a picture of a big sinkhole in the middle of the Brent Spence Bridge, and no one else but that one person has seen the sinkhole, we're going to be we're going to question it. So I think that we, you know, everything that's tweeted or posted on Facebook or Instagram, you you can't leave your journalism hat behind because it's social media. In fact, I would say it's even more important. But you also have the tools to verify at the at not equal speed, but close to it. Anyone else on the chat? Well, there's a, you know, there's a, <clears throat> there's a concept in evidence uh, called authentication, and the idea is that 
you cannot introduce a piece of evidence without somebody who can authenticate it. And all it means really is uh, if, I, if I have a witness on the stand and I want to, or if I have a, a picture that I want to use in a trial, I've got to put somebody on the stand who can say that photo is an accurate representation of whatever it purports to be. And I think sometimes uh, I've, seen, I've seen clients of mine, media clients of mine, lose sight of that a little bit. And I, in, in, in the context of social media, particularly, I had a TV station I was representing in another city, and they wanted to do a story on uh, synthetic marijuana. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you can buy it in 7-Eleven um, uh, kind of stores, you know, and it, it, it's packaged as potpourri, but uh, it's got similar chemical comp composition, and people were, you know, uh, having some reactions to it, and, and the several TV stations have done pieces on it, but this one reporter found a YouTube video of this guy who, you know, purportedly took one hit and just went nuts, and she wanted to include that in the piece, and I said, how do you, you know, how do you know that that's accurate? How do you know that that isn't somebody just totally pranking you and you know what how do you authenticate that and she really didn't have a very good answer to it uh you know and then she said well what's the harm and i was kind of like well you know thank god for jimmy kimmel because remember he did that that twerking thing <laughs> yeah. where he had that video of, of the woman twerking and then she set herself on fire and a lot of tv stations before they realized it was a print ran that i mean ktlv out in los angeles uh ran that as a news piece just they pulled it off the internet and then how embarrassed were they when it turned out that it was just, you know, it was a prank. So I think just that concept, you know, can, can somebody authenticate this is, is really important and, and you cannot lose sight of that. Verify, verify, verify. Yep. All right, let's talk about um, what, at least what I think are some ways in which uh, social media may in, enhance journalistic routine. And I'm going to, uh, since we're coming up on uh, spring break, I'm going to use an example that happened at Dayton University a couple years ago where there was a riot that occurred uh, around uh, St. Patrick's Day. And the uh, activity was coordinated primarily through Facebook and Twitter uh, that, you know, people said, okay, we're meeting here. This is what we're doing. And uh, social media got some criticism for facilitating this type of uh, melee. We also heard uh, some of this in Ferguson. Uh, however, police were also able to monitor that same social media activity. And they had a digital trail of who was involved, who said what, mm -hmm. uh, who started what. Uh, how could a journalist uh, t turn that around? Does that enhance beat reporting in any way? Um. It absolutely does, but again, I think you go back to like, it's really a challenge to decipher what is true and what's not. And there's, you, you know, if you're 99% sure that's not good enough. And so, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, very obsessive about being right. And so I, 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 I honestly, I, I mean, I'll just, I really struggle with it. I struggle with trying to decipher what's true and what's not. And I almost everything I find on social media, I, tr I go and try to confirm it somewhere else. Even if it's on John Cranley's Facebook page, I'm going to call him up or call up his PR guy and say, hey, saw this. Yeah, yeah, we put that up there. Um, yeah, that's. I think monitoring is the key. Um in so many ways. I wrote that down as something I wanted to share. Um, you know, I monitor um, dozens of media um, daily. We have a kind of a war room in our office, and there are media that I'll monitor, especially if I'm pitching a certain topic. And what that does is, um, not stalking, but I'm um, understanding uh, kind of what they're working on, what their tone is, are they really visual, before I even go out of the box to pitch them. So I want to make sure I'm not wasting their time because it is a relationship, right? So I want to make sure that I'm the best resource I can be because when they're in times of trouble and they need something quickly, I want them to think of me. Conversely, when my client's in trouble, um, I want them to give me a fair shot and, and, give, and do the story properly, good or bad. Um, so I think that's really, um, monitoring is the key. And I'll tell you a quick story. Um, one of your colleagues, I was out in, in LA doing a, a uh, project and I had TweetDeck up 
And I monitor this gal who does what I do in, in Charlotte, and she's just really good at what she does. She, her claim to fame is she brought Shaq on Twitter, which, yeah, whatever. Um, so um, anyways, uh, so um, you know, I've got her up, it's one of the things. And um, one of Jason's colleagues, um, I guess he direct messaged me on Twitter, and thank God I saw it, right? Because it was a story about social media and the Bengals. This is like Chad was still on the team, so this is years ago. And um, he said, hey, do you have a minute to talk about the use of social media and athletes? I said, sure, give me a call. Here's my cell phone, all direct message. Calls me, I think I sound somewhat intelligent, you know, and okay, great, story's gonna run Sunday. Next thing I know, I don't know why, I bring the cursor over to TweetDeck to her bar and I see uh, the same reporter. Hey, Kathleen, do you have a minute to talk about sport and social media? And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> cheating on me so I direct message him back and I say hey James are you cheating on me with Kathleen <laughs> he's like whoa <laughs> so I got the pull quote end of the story <laughs> yes monitoring I I think that um, one of the things that that I've grown to really love and um, we really we really work hard to nurture at WCPO is the use of user-generated content at UGC um, we can't be everywhere when snow apocalypse, snow apocalypse happens, but our, we don't even have to go on the air anymore or ask for people to, to send us their photos of snow-covered patio furniture um, <laughs> or um, things that are more serious. Um, there may be a really bad accident somewhere on 275. We get a picture tweeted to us. While we're uh, verifying and finding out what's going on, we already have an image that we can use, and then we give credit to that person on the air or on our website, uh, make a photo gallery from their um, their work, thank them when when we're when we're done. We did a lot of photo galleries um, last week, and um, to me, the biggest the best thing you can do with social media is say thank you. And so um, we really love user generated content. Now video is starting to come in, and to me, um, the opportunity to tap into people who become then content creators in a way, um, who are uh, might be great sources. Uh, my colleagues in the Scripps building downtown, if they see an accident right in their front yard, they'll tweet to us and we'll retweet. So to us, that um, we feel like social media has enhanced journalism because of the eyes and ears that, that we can tap into. Again, we do have to confirm. We have to figure out, is this a troll? Is this a crazy person? There are a number of parody accounts that have popped up trying to get a rise out of people at WCPO. Um, John Matteries has two <laughs> uh, parody accounts. So we, we just try to uh, tap into the general knowledge of the community, and I think that enhances journalism uh, in a big way. We also use it to find story sources. Um, we um, did a, a, have done a great couple of education pieces where we've actually started the conversation by asking on Facebook about the Common Core. Um, and then you get the crazy people, but you also get a mom who really does want to talk about this with somebody um, because she feels passionately about it. Um, they can either uh, comment on our wall or email us. We'll include an email address. So we use social media to bring voices to our coverage that may not have been there before. One of my pet peeves is the usual suspects. Sometimes when you're on a beat or you've been in a city for a long time, you just keep going back to the same people. There's no diversity in gender or class or race. So with social media, you can sometimes reach people, bloggers, who may be very knowledgeable in their field or have a perspective to share. So to me, um, that's one of the things that excites me about social media and journalism today, which is that opportunity to bring voices up um, that may not have been heard before and perspectives from the region. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about audience participation in, in the news cycle. I think that's one of the, 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 the most significant impacts that we've seen, or as, as you said earlier, it's, it's become uh, a two-way street that news audience don't just consume the news uh, with social media that they have the power to participate in, in the storytelling uh, as well. And uh, well, I think one of the ways that we saw that most notably recently was uh, with, with what transpired in, in Ferguson. And we had um, a, a, a group that were using this platform to tell their own stories about what was happening in their, in their community, uh, in addition to, uh, certainly to a national, international audience, but also gave the ability of, of that national, international audience uh, 
uh, to respond and to provide uh, commentary. Uh, one of the most uh, notable hashtags um, uh, in, that, that came out of Ferguson was, uh, if they gunned me down. And it was clearly a commentary at traditional news media to, to, to tend to focus on um, one image of, 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 of a person. And you know, whether that image happens to look more wholesome or whether it happens to look you know, more like uh, you know, someone could be characterized as a thug is significant. So with, with, uh, with the hashtag, if they got me down, you had several people who posted, you know, juxtaposed images of themselves. One in uh, a more, you know, family, traditional setting, maybe at a graduation, you know, with cap and gown, uh, and another in street clothes, maybe holding a cigarette or a beer or something that could be broadly interpreted as, as antisocial behavior, and said, well, if I was gunned down, which image of me would pervade uh, in the media? Uh, how do you as journalists feel about that? Do you feel that you're losing control of, uh, the, of, of the storytelling, or uh, is, is this, is, is come back to what Holly said, something that we should absolutely embrace as, as having more diversity of voices? Embrace. <laughs> um, one of the greatest people covering Ferguson is a young man not that much older than some of you students here, Wes Lowry. He went to OU. He um, works for the Washington Post. He used Vine, which uh, my family is all in St. Louis, so to me it was very close to home. And I was glued to my Vine feed because in six seconds he was showing voices, faces, advocates, um, spokespersons for the movement, um, uh, other journalists being, you know, roughed up. Um, it was it was fantastic, and to me, it's. I don't feel like I'm losing control because I'm very much, um, like I said, where has this been all my life? You know, I feel like I'm an, my inner inner person is actually a millennial, even though I'm a couple of generations beyond that. Um, I feel like wow, the possibilities are almost endless, and. I do embrace it. I, I feel like I'm part of it, so I don't feel le left out. I feel like um, I'm in the conversation. I tweet regularly. I'm on Vine, Instagram, um, for my own personal reasons as well as for work. And so to me, it's all part of the mosaic of what's happening in our community. Um, it's, it's not separate from my life. It's, it's part of what I do and part of my life. And so to, to feel, if you feel like you're left out, then, then I think what you would need to do is sort of redouble your efforts to plunge back in. Because if you are a journalist, um, especially for you all coming out of school, you will be expected to use it as a tool in your work to find sources, to engage. A Washington Post reporter posting his first coverage on Vine and not in the Washington Post, that's pretty radical. You know, of course he did great write-throughs for the paper, for the actual piece of paper, and on the digital um, platform, but he was using all the tools at his disposal because this was happening right now and it's really, really important and I want people who don't read the Washington Post to see this vine and understand what's happening in Ferguson. Uh, I would uh, concur with a lot of that. I definitely embrace it. I think it's great. Uh, some of it's a bunch of BS, but that's fine. Um, uh, I think, you know, the thing with, if I can take it back to a news story or something as a part of your beat, um, you know, I monitor the conversation constantly on a big news story and on things that are on my beat. And I've come to really trust people who are passionate in the community about uh, certain topics. Like I can think of people I've really come to know um, who I value what they have to say about the streetcar because I've come to know them through uh, so for, through Twitter, like uh, I, I think someone Paige is here and Derek Bauman and Bill Collins, and these are people I, I don't necessarily always agree with what they say, but um, I value what they have to say. I know they're very knowledgeable. And so I think as a part of, you know, kicking it back to the big news story, if you're constantly monitoring, monitoring the conversation and you know the audience, you know the, you know the people, you know some people who are involved in the conversation, it it really lends to the credibility of the whole thing. Um, so I fully, I think it's a great thing. I also think that it keeps uh, the traditional legacy media people honest. I have a much thicker skin now because of social media. Uh, I used to get really mad about everything, every little email I got back before social media. Uh, but now I love it. I, I like. I mean, I'm fine when people just take swipes at me. It's fine, like I, because it's all a part of the conversation and. Um, you're, you're entitled to your opinion, and I can see it in real time, like right now, so it's great. 
Yeah, and I would, I would say for you as, as budding journalists, budding professionals, embrace social media to project your own brand. You know, there's last semester, one of the, I got into a debate with a student, and he's like, I'm not on Facebook, it's stupid. I'm like, well, because your grandmother's posting pictures, I'm sure. But you've, you've got to be there. You've got to be there um, using social media to project your brand. You know, if, if I'm hiring somebody and I, you know, I'm like, oh gosh, candidate A, candidate B, boy, they're really both solid. Who do I, you know, they're 24, probably first or second job out of school. And I go to Facebook and I see candidate A has spent the weekend at Habitat for Humanity volunteering, right? Oh, that's cool. That's really nice. Candidate B is um, at a keg party posting, don't know how I'm going to get up to go to work Monday. Right? Who am I going to hire? And I've seen that so many times, you guys. So clean up social media, use it to your own. Do it today. Advantage. After this. Yes. <laughs> and be there. Don't you know? Don't act like Facebook is this ugly monster. Um, use it to help advance your own brand. You know, your cause, your work. You know, you guys are doing so many great things on this campus. It's such a, a great opportunity for you to in your life to to be using social media and. Um, there's this little thing called Google that captures everything, so make sure you clean it up and um, you embrace it and you use it strategically to project the brand you want to an employer. Always think of the employer sitting across the table from you and um, make sure that's, that's kind of your perspective when you're sharing social media content. Let's talk then about uh, trolls, for instance, and some of the nastier comments that you can get through social media, whether it's Facebook or, or Twitter. Uh, oftentimes, uh, people are a lot more brave, a lot more nasty uh, electronically than they are uh, in person. Uh, how do you uh, distinguish in, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, these comments I'm going to respond to, these comments I'm going to ignore? Is it a good idea to... Uh, converse. Uh, how do you how do you make that uh, uh, that decision? Well, um, my feeling is that for when you look at your engagement numbers on Facebook, even negative comments count as engagement. <laughs> so we're kind of okay with it. And my skin has gotten a lot thicker because of social media. Um, we went through a, a phase about a year ago. So WCPO launched. Um, the first ever that we, as far as we know of, um, an option for users to subscribe and have premium content, events, deals, freebies, a membership. Um, but what people took from that at first was, you're making us pay for news, we hate you, you suck. And um, people on Facebook, you're pretty much who you are. Facebook makes it hard to be anonymous. So people were quite happy to fill our feet up with, we hate you, we hate you, we hate you. Um, and so what we did was, we, we simply couldn't keep up with all the haters. So what we did, though, is if people had a legitimate question, like, why are you doing this? Um, how can I subscribe? Or I don't think this is a good idea. Here's why. I'd like to hear your opinion. We would answer those folks. We would definitely answer. What happens is when you post a piece of content, and the trolls come out, if you engage the trolls, the conversation becomes about what the troll is saying and not the content, the really valuable content that you've posted. So uh, I have two community managers who report to me. Great job if you guys are interested in social media and journalism. And we really, we started being really selective about how we responded to people. If we posted a piece of content that was premium um, and it went off the rails because people were saying, whatever happened to freedom of the press, which I know that's not what it's about, but you know, we, we let people you know, believe that freedom of the press means you don't have to pay for news, sure. Or is this where my tax dollars are going? No. Um, so we, 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 we let that go, but if people had legitimate questions, we would answer them. And what has happened now is we hardly get any trolls on um, talking about paying for news. And we worked really, really hard on that. And we still respond, though, if people do ask. I was telling Jeff earlier, what we also find is that people will will uh, regulate each other in a forum like that. So, so when we had, uh, we had one false alarm of, of, of weather a couple weekends ago and someone posted how WCPO is inaccurate and you're terrible and blah, blah, blah. And everyone else jumped in and scolded that person and said, listen, all the, all the TV stations had the same information. Um, they're trying to make us safe, trying to get us to be prepared. So when we see that, we love it. We let that go because that's a conversation amongst users and they're having that. 
Um, there's a, one more thing. There's a really great um, This American Life episode recently all about a blogger who got a really, really terrible, personally motivated troll. And she engaged this troll. And if I can remember, I'll send you the link. And it, the ending is amazing, because usually what happens if you, do, if you do engage people, it can go one of two ways. You can totally diffuse it if you're killing them with kindness. If you try to out-troll them, you're never going to win. But if, thank you for your feedback, you suck, thank you for your feedback, um, <laughs> you can diffuse. But if you go back to them with, well, you're worse, that's not going to be a good thing. But So there's a lot of lessons to be learned out of that episode, and I will try and find that and get that to you. Yeah, thank you for your feedback is code for... <laughs> <laughs> Screw off. Crazy! <laughs> yeah, panel. You know what I mean. <laughs> I might skew this a little towards uh, uh, Jack's direction now. It, it, are there many cases where journalists maybe have gotten themselves in trouble engaging the mm -hmm. trolls or in which maybe the troll has crossed the line? Yes, they've, they've said something that's uninformed, maybe bigoted, racist, misogynistic, but they've now are saying something that's really threatening, uh, something that you, you're oh, yeah. concerned yeah. for your safety. That's definitely happened. Uh, I was a victim of a, of a uh, anonymous comment, and there was a, the Enquirer ran a story about it, just this public records dispute, and they mentioned that you know I had filed a lawsuit <laughs> And this is before the. This is when the Enquirer was still taking anonymous postings, and somebody said, "Hey, Jack Reiner, why don't you put your six thousand dollars suit on and get in your hundred thousand dollar car and drive out of town?" And my, that was, huh? no, my, so my my kids, my I got I got two. My daughter, my daughter saw it, and she writes and says, "They'd be surprised when they find out mom buys them at Value City, huh?" <laughs> And my son said, if you put on every article of clothing you own at once, it wouldn't be worth six thousand uh, dollars. But that's funny. What, and I was driving a Hyundai Sonata, by the way. Uh, but one of the interesting uh, issue, a very interesting issue that came up that, that sort of touches on a lot of that was the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer a few years ago. When again, we're still permitting anonymous commenters. Uh, and, and since I, I don't know if the plane dealer has changed. I know the Enquirer requires now that you go through Facebook to comment, so it, it, there, there really are no anonymous commenters. But uh, several years ago, and, and I'll throw this out here, I'd be interested to see what the journalists think about this. But um, so the plane dealer was covering a, a very contentious murder trial in Cleveland, and they were getting routinely a lot of comments including a, a fairly regular commenter by the name of, uh, that, that went by the name of Law Miss, L-A-W-M-I-S-S. -S. And at one point, this commenter made what the plane dealer felt was a threatening comment uh, directed towards the reporter. And I don't remember exactly what the threat was, but it was, it was concerning. So they, they took a look at the, um, the information that they had on this person, and I think were able to trace it back to an IP address. And the IP address was uh, owned by the judge in the murder trial. Whoa. Ouch. <laughs> so what do you do uh, about that if you're the Cleveland plain dealer? And, and the, the dilemma to me was, you know, I, I had handled a number of cases for the Enquirer where people would write and say, hey, I want to know who that poster is because they've libeled me or, or whatever. And we even had a couple of cases where subpoenas were issued, and, and we wouldn't produce it. You know, we no, we're not going to give uh, that information. Uh, there's a couple of theories of why, but, you know, the plane dealer made the editorial decision to write the story and identify the IP address. Now the judge said, and the judge's daughter said it was the judge's daughter who was using right. the, the, the mom's computer. I guess we'll never know the truth, but that judge did file a, an invasion of privacy claim against the plane dealer, which, which ultimately settled on terms pretty favorable to the plain dealer. They made a charitable contribution in the judge's name. But, you know, I, I wondered, and again, I, I, I value the, the input. I mean, did the plain dealer, you know, it was, was the plain, and assume that the plain dealer would routinely not disclose anonymous posters, identities. Are they being consistent? Jason? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So, 
But if they're by not disclosing? Well, I mean, my point was, look, if, I, if I'm your, if, you know, if, if I'm representing the media and, and, and somebody says, I'd like to know who that source is, we'd say, no, we're not going to give that up. You know, we, we, we uh, protect the privacy of the posters and we're not going to identify the posters. But now all of a sudden the plane dealer gets a really juicy story and boom, they identify. To me, I, I, you know, I was a little troubled by it. I thought it was a little inconsistent. Well, you're asking me, but this is where I would email you. I know. And <laughs> ask you about yeah, it. Yeah, you know what? It, it, well, it's, it's, I mean, there's, it's, it, honestly, I think it's more of a journalist, journalism yeah. question than a legal question. I mean, they clearly, well, and, and the thing is, the terms of service, 99% of the time, you know, terms of service for websites will give the host wiggle room in terms of identifying the, the, the source. I mean, if you look at, go to anybody's, you know, go to wcpo.com, go to enquire.com, and you will find some, some language that some lawyer wrote that, you know, allows for that site to identify the poster if they feel like it. It, it really comes down to, it doesn't exactly say if we feel like it, it'll be a little more fancy it's language wide latitude. Wide, wide latitude. latitude. I, yeah, I, I think that, uh, I think it would have to be a, almost a case by case basis, like that's a public figure. And so I think you certainly would have to have a conversation with your attorney. Um, in this case, it would be Jack for us and I mean, it, at the end, of the, I mean, it's a judgment call between the editor and the attorney. Um, but certainly, I think you have to really think hard about it because it is a public figure who gets paid by your tax dollars. So I can guarantee it sold some newspapers. <laughs> sure, it did. Well, I'll tell you, I, well, one, I'm sorry, but one thing that that I feel pretty strongly about, and and not every court around the country agrees with me on this, but <clears throat> I, I do not think it is a good idea for uh, media outlets to treat anonymous posters as sources and, and invoke the statutory privilege that allows you not to identify sources. I, I think a source is someone with whom you've developed a relationship and there's an understanding that they're going to give you information and you're going to protect their identity. And I, th and I think you sort of cheapen that uh, and, and that, that relationship should be protected. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court's found that the First Amendment doesn't protect that, but uh, 49 states have, have either statutorily or through the courts established protection for that relationship. But I think it, re it protects the relationship. Some uh, courts, and I think Oregon and, and uh, I can't remember, three or four, have agreed, however, that the source protections, you know, the, or the reporter shield statute can apply to an anonymous poster. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's a good idea. I think that Jason touched on something that's very key to journalism is that we have our um, our baseline ethical standards and our professional practices but there's so many individual cases that come up that journalism is a case-by-case -case basis. You know you have to look at and I think you said that they perceived it as a threat right. so there's that aspect to it. Public figure, threatening language, um, I'm not sure what I, what I would have done in that situation, but I think that it's conversation that we have in newsrooms every day over, the, I think it was yesterday, a, a woman tried to kill herself in a very public way by jumping off a building in downtown. We don't usually report on suicide. However, that act had public in, implications because it happened in public. So we had people asking questions on our Facebook page, why didn't you report this? And we said we, we decided not to because um, you know, we, we, we weighed the, the public interest and this person's privacy and the fact that when you report on suicides, you open up a can, can of worms that, that is um, out of your control. So I think that we, and those of you who are about to graduate and get jobs, you will find that there's no textbook answer sometimes um, to a situation you have to just talk it out and you don't always make the right call. 
yeah. you know? Live and learn. Uh, before we uh, go on, do, are, there, are there any questions? Um, anyone would, would like to raise a question to the panel? Are you just stretching or are you going to ask <laughs> Oh, go for okay, it. Okay, I knew it. Go for it. on the spot here. Um, just because that was really interesting, the, the point that Jack, that you made about the, um, the judgment call to make on that, because if you're putting something out there in the Twitter sphere, you know, should it be your uh, job to go and investigate whether that was written by you, you know? Whether the byline is, like, whether we can take the excuse of the daughter writing it as viable or not, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it, I, it, it it was just too good of a story, I think, for the paper to pass up. But I, but I, I mean, honestly, you know, and I get that. Um, but I, uh, I still think it, it, it makes it to me. It has to make it harder once you make that decision that we're gonna, we're gonna identify who this person is. It just makes the next time you ask your lawyer to go into court and fight a subpoena. It makes my job that much harder. And it's really all about me. That's what's... <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> but that's it. it, 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 it you know, it, and again, take it outside of that context. What if you perceive a threat? I mean, it, and again, if it's a threat to your reporter, you, you know, I think you owe an obligation to your reporter. But what if it's a threat to somebody not, that, you know, not associated with you? Do, you? do you go to the police? How much information do you, do you give to the police? These are tough calls. And they, they really aren't at the end of the day, legal decisions because, again, the terms and conditions protect you legally. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably not, uh, you know, you haven't violated your terms and conditions because you've said right out front, you, you sort of reserve the right to disclose this information based on your judgment. So you're really protected legally. It's, it's more of a journalistic ethics question, and, and it's tough. I mean, it's, it, 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 there is no easy answer to it. There should be like some sort of right to defend, respond, Said this, like, do you have a response to this? Do you have a defense for this? Can I ethically publish this without, you know, any backlash? I well, I think I, I, mean, I, I think you always need to make an effort in, as a journalist, and I'm speaking a little out of out of my my range here. But I mean, I think I think journalists have got to make an effort to to get both sides of the story. Yeah, d social media doesn't change that. In fact, I think the burden becomes even greater that you're um, verifying and uh, asking, giving people the opportunity to respond um, right up until deadline or right in, up until airtime, although now our deadlines are constantly shifting. So, so I think that, um, you know, remember always that the venue doesn't matter. In 20 years, there might be something other than this. It doesn't matter what the venue is or the platform. The principles and the standards and the professional practices and the ethical standards have to remain. You know, um, that is, that's, a, that's not negotiable. That's what really troubled me most about the Rolling Stone UVA thing, honestly. I mean, my understanding is that, you know, the woman that they were talking to about the, the, the rape, you know, basically said, kind of put conditions, that, and one of them was they, they couldn't talk to the the people she identified. I, I just don't know how you do that story under those circumstances. I just don't get it. I mean, I really don't. And you know, <clears throat> really Rolling Stone? <laughs> yeah. uh, you've been around this game a little bit too long to make that kind of mistake. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, Wendy, uh, ex except my mom is a sole source if she told me she loved me, right? Uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's another question. There. Oh yes, oh. another question. <laughs> Talked about uh, these constant monitoring, verification of all these sources that you get. How do you balance exactly putting out, verifying this information, and putting it out on social media and the internet with the more old school news priorities like newspapers and uh, morning news, afternoon news, et cetera, et cetera? Well, to me, you have you use the multiple people in your newsroom and the tools at your disposal to, you can literally multitask this uh, out. We did, sometimes though, you trusted sources do let you down. Um, when I was first start, joined WCPO, there was an incident um, uh, that we heard on the police scanner. We called to verify. They, the police, who we trust as a source, confirmed that this, in fact, the, I think they had found a body. They said the body was dead. It turned out he wasn't dead. Um, so, so, 
you still have to trust a little bit your sources, and that's why trusting an anonymous source who tells you you can't talk to anybody else for this story is a red flag, right? So even if Cedric, who pitches me stories, I know he works for UC, I know he's a, he tr I trust him, uh, my, my writers trust him, um, you know, we're gonna, what's that? Check it all, Check it all anyways, you know? <laughs> I think that it is, it is a challenge in this day and age, like when you only, if you were a newspaper reporter back in the day, you had one job, as a, as a Twitter account says, you, you worked on that story, your deadline was at whatever time, you filed that story and you followed it up the next day. If you're a TV reporter, you had one job, you did a live shot at five, a package, and you went home and you did it again the next day. Now everybody has three or four things that they're doing, fewer people to help them, um, and many, many tools to help them. So it's balancing, but always going back to that, what are my basic, what am I doing here? Am I giving out information that I don't feel confident is right? You know, that doesn't change. Any other questions? Right. Talk about tools, um, beyond just reaching out to sources and trying to verify, what are some of the tools you're using, especially for things like photos, if they're not, have not been photoshopped, um, what are you doing in that? Well, there's a little bit of trust involved there, too. Um, there's Google. We generally, if, if it's, and, and there's varying levels of, um, of verification as well. So if it is a snowman that someone says, this is a snowman in my backyard in Hebron, I, I feel okay with taking Jane's word for it. <laughs> Right, but if someone sends me a, a photograph of a car that exploded on a highway, I don't know where that highway is. So I'm going to make a call to highway patrol, to you know, the traffic people to start verifying the, that process. If someone sends me a direct message and says, hey listen, there's something shady going on at such and such high school with the lunch money, don't, don't, I don't want to be involved, I don't want to be interviewed, then the, 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 the burden is higher yet. So I think that the tools you use are just the old-fashioned ones, asking, um, searching, researching, uh, and, and then asking actual people who you do trust. And even then, sometimes... Yeah, I think everything right here. <laughs> You know, I, I remember this was a couple years ago, and um, I work on the Flying Pig Marathon, and the, the 10K was going on on Saturday, and, you know, nobody's going to cover a 10K. But I'm standing there at the finish line, and the men's winner across, and the female winners are coming in, and I'm just going to get video, and then we'll post it on Facebook. And, you know, Holly doesn't really care about a 10K. She cares about the marathon, probably, but... And all of a sudden, I see the winning female drop. I mean, she goes down like a shot. She's like 100 yards in front of me, like, oh, my God, she fell. She hit the wall. And, and she was winning by a lot. And I'm just standing there, like, almost shaking, taking this video, you know, on my phone. And uh, all of a sudden, here comes number two woman, helps her up, and lets her cross first. Oh. I mean, I'm getting chills telling you the story. And I posted that on Facebook. Um, Channel 5 used it in their live broadcast of the Flying Pig, and the Today Show used it, all on my phone. So it's, um, these phones are amazing anymore. And so, you know, in, in my mind, I'm always trying to be the eyes and ears for people like Holly and Jason. And, and what I hope that's doing is, you know, establishing my credibility that, you know, they can, they can trust us and, you know, we're kind of resources there for you. But I mean, there's iMovie on this. There's, I mean, it's ridiculous what you can do. Jenny, did you have a question? Um. My question was, if, if each of you could speak to it, it, it might just be a short answer, but your, your favorite and least favorite thing about social media in your life or on your jobs, so what you love most about it and what you dislike most about it <laughs> in terms question. of how it functions in your life. I, I love it because it really it broadens my world. It makes me a better journalist. I think it makes me a citizen of the world. I think the hardest part is disconnecting that and that's really not I can't hate social media for that that's my own problem <laughs> so that first thing in the morning where you're like this <laughs> you're going oh my gosh I got three retweets you know that that kind of it's it's a little bit of it, it taps into your vanity you know uh, I think that's a big part of social media so I think that would be the worst part but to me uh, the way that I use it I feel it's a power for good uh, more than than anything else um. You know, I've just, 
I think what I've come to like most about it is where I've, I've met people who I, you know, I don't know them real well, but maybe I've been to a conference or something, and I, I've, I've spent a dinner talking to somebody, and <clears throat> if we've become Facebook friends, uh, I don't do it just so I have a lot of Facebook friends, but I, I have found, I, you know, there's, there's a lawyer in Seattle, and there's a, another person I've gotten to know, and they're just the most interesting people. I mean, what they post fascinates me, you know, because they'll find some essay or something, and I just, I, and so I really like that. I mean, I just, I just like the, the connection um, and, and the, you know, the potential it opens up for just continual learning. And I guess, I, and again, I think the least, the least favorite is, I have to agree with Ollie that I feel like sort of a slave to it sometimes, and, and, and the allowing my self-esteem to take a hit when I don't have something on my little Facebook thing that, you know, like, I've been mentioned, what? It's, it's been hours. Yeah. <laughs> I think if I may speak for you, Jack, I think um, Jack's, Jack's a very successful attorney in, you know, our community and, and certainly beyond, and I think social media has created Jack Point, too. Oh. I mean, you, you really use social media in such a very thought leadership way that, um, you know, he's on the Inquirer, he's on Facebook, he's on Twitter, and Jack 2.0 is alive and well. I can't wait to see what 3.0 is. Oh, yeah. Um, I think for me, it's made the world much smaller, right? So, you know, I can tell, um, you know, if Jason and I need to just, you know, chit chat up here, I can say, oh, Hilton Head, huh? You want to retire there? Okay, cool. Because I saw that on Twitter, right? Um, you know, we pay thousands of dollars for this media database so I can pitch the right people nationally, locally, whatever. And, you know, you can't find a Today Show producer to save your life on this database. You know, it's like they're in witness protection program. <laughs> and now through Twitter, you know, I've become buds with this gal who produces for Kathy Lee and Hoda. And, you know, so there's this relationship building and she's probably a little more trusting that, you know, I'm not spamming her, but I'm sending her direct pitches, personal pitches, because I know. I know what she likes, what she dislikes, um, because I'm, I'm reading her social media stuff. What I do not like, I hate Snapchat. I hate it for so many reasons. <laughs> I know you guys love it, but I hate it. <laughs> it goes against everything that I believe social media can do well in terms of SEO and, and everything, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, what I like most is that um, it is a trim it's just it's a lot of tools in the toolbox to um, improve uh, me as a journalist. Like I said, it holds me more accountable, I feel. It's a great tool. Like I broke a, excuse me, I broke a story a couple weeks ago on the uh, Hopple Street Bridge when I found out the, the fiance of the guy who died had hired an attorney, but I had to dig through Facebook. I found her, I sent her an inbox message. Then I started to look at her friends to see who had the same name. Then I ended up getting to a cousin of the guy who passed away. I Googled him and I found that his, his cell phone actually was on some website. And he called me, called me, said, yeah, they, they've hired this guy. I'm like, wow. I, w I mean, how am I getting that without Facebook? Yeah, um, that's cool. What I don't like is <laughs> uh, the drama. I don't like a lot of drama. My personal <laughs> thoughts are don't play your emotions out on social media. Um, which is why I don't really like Facebook all that well. Um, and really, I'm, I am a slave to this thing. Like I, it's, I, I will say like it's caused lots of arguments with my wife. Um, <laughs> Twitter has because I'm, I'm on it constantly. It's addicting. Um, even at dinner? Uh, yeah, even at dinner sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think but I, it's great, yeah. I think that would be a really good question for, an, for another panel of how social media blends the personal and the professional. I mean, we've talked a yeah. lot about professional <laughs> uses of it, but we really didn't touch on, you know, where, instances where it crosses the line in, in, into the personal. I, I think that's my answer to that question would be, you know, that it blends the personal and the professional. That's why I love it. That's why I hate it. So um, there's a couple more, more questions. Yes, sir. Talking about the personal like, words right there personal stories that you put on like social media. I feel like with the like character restrictions like on Twitter, you have to use like better words. And in that like sense that like, you have more expressive word choices or more maybe like better on stronger vocabulary. But with that stronger vocabulary comes more biased opinion. How do you know <laughs> he was claimed to he, he just said, you know? Yeah. So I feel like the, the social media kind of makes things more biased. 
That's an interesting concept because I hate slang on Twitter. I hate you are. I just because I'm just you know I went to journalism school too and it drives me crazy. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think I think Twitter is provocative and that's the beauty of it. And to Jack's point, I mean, I love Twitter because there's so many things I learn on Twitter that I would never have read in a daily newspaper or seen on TV, a white paper or, you know, something that a blogger that I've never um, heard of wrote that is just kind of forming and shaping, you know, my worldly views. So that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. I that's think that I you have to, it. in a way, you, you, if you are tweeting on behalf of a news organization, for example, or uh, so you're tweeting a headline, you're going to tweet the headline of the story. Maybe you're going to hashtag or add a handle in there. Um, and so that sort of, since you have already have your journalism bar up for the headline, the tweet then becomes a tweet of the headline. I think the next step up from that, which is far more engaging, is adding a little personality or swagger to your tweet, which um, not all news organizations um, are good at or can do or even want to go there. I feel like the New York Times has a very interesting voice on Twitter. Like, they're a little less, this is the New York Times, you know, so if you see some of their tweets, um, but it it's, depends on the story. You're not going to try to play fast and loose with a tweet about, ISIS, you know, but if it's a tweet about, you know, a photo gallery about with teddy bears in it, you could probably use a little more creative language. You could be more fun uh, with it. So we at WCPO, we try to, when we can, when we think it's appropriate, we try to put some personality into our tweets. But we also recognize that people do look at us as a headline service in a way. They use our Twitter, they use Twitter as a headline service. This happened, this happened, this happened. So, so there's a blend there. And sometimes, you know, news organizations mess up with that, you know. And I, but as an individual, even though I use Twitter as me and not associated with uh, my work account, I still work for WCPO. I still work for the Scripps company. I'm a journalist wherever I go. I'm always going to be mindful of how I tweet, what I tweet. I, when I feel like being snarky, I just count to 10. <laughs> You know, when I feel like um, sometimes there's something I really want to retweet, but I'm like, you know what, that is not appropriate. Let me just favorite that and enjoy it privately. Yeah. You know, so, so I think it, it has to do with um, you, you have to have a filter for yourself as well as wherever you go, a journalist takes, you take your career with you in your hands. It's precious. It goes to your brand. Um, and so your tone is really important. Yeah. Um, I... I mean, honestly, one of the things I don't like about it is I can't be as expressive in my opinion as I'd like to be. Um, it, but I, people are just paying it. Like Jackie remembered, I tweeted something about Hilton Head the other day. I mean, people are so in tune to like what you're saying, and so you have to be so careful with what you say and how you say it. I mean, I, I'm I'm being honest with you. There was a city official. Uh, it was a couple months ago. One of our reporters liked something on Facebook, liked it. And the city official called her and said, why did you like, it was something that he was not in favor of, and it was by another city council member, and called her and said, you're biased because you liked what that person had to say. And it was, I'm like, wow, talk about thin skin, <laughs> wow. Um, but it's like, Watching. it's a constant judgment. Like it's, yeah. you're constantly, uh, the other thing too is like what my coworker, Sherry Coolidge, who covers City Hall, we're really close. And so we, we're constantly bouncing. We'll write a tweet out and we'll say, hey, we'll throw it, I'll throw it off her. Should I send this? No. That's, <laughs> and she'll do the same thing with me. Yeah. And it's, it's great to have that there because I'd probably be fired by now after some of this stuff I would, I would send out. <laughs> I think we have time for uh, uh, one more question, uh, Bob. Well, I, in a, lot of, a lot of Twitter accounts, especially a few years ago, would say, you know, the journalists would say, retweets are not endorsements. Yeah. Do your news organizations, though, look at retweets and likes and such as somewhat endorsing by, by basically spreading the word on your social we, we don't. We ask that our people um, exercise really good judgment. And, and sometimes people get called into the office, you know, that was not the right, the best thing to retweet. But I think that most journalists um, at this level in, in their career realize the, the power of that. And so I don't know that it does any good to put in your Twitter bio, retweets are not endorsements, likes are not endorsements. Tweets do not reflect that of my employer, because people will just blow past that. They'll be like, Jason works for the Inquirer, he just said that 
um, you know, Jeff Ruby is terrible, so he must be, you know, we're holding him to that, right? So I think that you, you still, doesn't matter what disclaimer you put on there, you know? So to me, I just try to always practice what I hope is a good balance of who I genuinely am, what, who I'm working for, and my own personal brand. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I think that's the dumbest thing. Like people, like you, it's a waste of space on your bio. It's only 140 <laughs> characters in it, 140. Um, um, yeah, I don't think that's a big deal. Attribution. So we're seeing tweets appear in stories now. You can embed within, especially with the online story. How are you attributing um, sources that you get from online media, the digital media? You know, I... I, I was listening to the local NPR station a couple weeks ago, and they, they said social media is reporting that. And I just thought to myself, that's kind of gibberish, really. I mean, like, what's, you know, it's, it means we read this on Twitter. I mean, it's just, you got to be kidding me. I, that just blew my mind. Uh, yeah. ESPN is good with that. You know, though, uh, Coach Cal is saying today, uh, thank you, Twitter, right? So, you know, and they always show the, the Twitter, which I think is cool. I think it's, I think it's really fun to, to show the social media as part of the broadcast and then use it as part of the script just to verify, verify. Yeah. Well, if it's, if it's for example, um, say it's Jackie, I'm trust Jackie as a source and she's saying something. Is it going to advance the story? Is it a quote that I could have gotten it on the phone or Jackie tweeted it to me? So I, I try not to look at it as a social media quote. It's a, it's a piece of information. Does it advance the story? Does it make the story better? If not, embedding eight quotes in a story just because it looks cool and I can, doesn't necessarily mean anything, but if the story is about how, for example, Devin Still has used social media to tell the world the story of his daughter fighting cancer, I want to embed those tweets. I want to att I'll attribute it in the text of the story, and I'll, sc I'll have a screen grab image embedded in the story. To me, it's just another texture piece, but it has to make sense. You know, I think some people do it because it looks cool. We'll just throw a tweet in there. You know, but I feel like does it advance the story? Does it make sense? Uh, and, and I guess the other thing too, especially for the students, is that you know when you get in the real world, you know check with your uh, media company about what the social media policy is. Um, I know some of them are probably very loosely worded. I think WCPO does a really good job with their um, uh, social media approach. They have a whole team that's that does it, and that's I believe that's all you do, right? Is social media? Um, no, I do I do two things, but social media is a big part of it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so they have staff members dedicated to that, and I, I mean I, it is it's a judgment call. You got to bounce it off of your coworkers, but it's good to know if there's a social media policy in place, which in 2015 I sure as hell hope there is. Mm -hmm. Like just familiarize you know, yourself with it. I still think the authentication piece is pretty, you know, like, and it could be pretty valuable stuff. I mean, like, you know, um, that story that Eddie Murphy didn't want to do Bill Cosby on Saturday Night Live, I think that basically came from a bunch of tweets from Norm MacDonald, you know? And, I mean, that was a verified account, and it was so, so as opposed to social media is reporting. When I hear that, it's like, what's that? I have no idea what that means. But, you know, so I think there's, there's a difference there. But. Very least, should say someone on social right, media. Right. Is yeah, like so, yeah, it's like this and entity. Trying to figure out who that someone is. Uh, cool dude, twenty nine says. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let that be the uh, final word. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, panelists. Thanks for coming. This was great.